Hello. We are announcing a brand new giveaway for 75,000 subscribers. All you have to do is obviously follow me. We are giving away one lightsaber from Art Sabers. They are sponsoring this giveaway, so what you have to do is go to the pinned comment down below, follow Art Sabers on Instagram, like their image, and tag two of your friends, and you will be entered into our giveaway. We will be doing this giveaway until we hit 75,000 subscribers here on PPSW. Thank you again for your continuous support. Our story continues inside the Grand Jedi Temple. This was a wondrous building, large, filled with so much history and power. There were so many things as younglings that the Jedi were taught about their order. The rise of the ancient Jedi created nearly 25,000 years before. Of course that order no longer existed, and in its place was something completely new and retrofitted for a modern galaxy, as was the sign of the times. The Jedi always felt like they needed to update their style to fit the galaxy they sat within. The Jedi always evolved and they continued to do so. Today was an exciting day inside the Jedi Temple. Well, no one really knew if it was that exciting. There was news traveling around the temple itself. Not everyone was fully aware of what it was. As a youngling, Titus was just like the rest of the class, unaware of what the meaning of this was. The day started as it typically did for Titus. He and his class of younglings went to the far side of the temple. There was a ledge and they went there for their morning meditation. The purpose of this meditation was to give the Jedi breath into the new day. It was very soothing and the Jedi recommended that knights and even masters follow the same procedure. Not every Jedi did, but for the most part, Jedi all across the temple would do this exercise. For the younglings, they did it in public, for example, classrooms, ledges, the Jedi garden in the great hall or even on the steps of the temple, wherever the class wanted to go during that given day. Other Jedi within the Order and within the temple itself would typically do these meditative exercises in their rooms, and if they were off-world, well, they made it work if they followed it. These morning meditations lasted from the first set of dawn until around an hour afterwards. The meaning of these meditations was to feel the force around them. Coruscant was an ancient planet, covered in cities now, but once it was not covered in the concrete jungle. Every Jedi, when they were about five or six years old, would take a class trip to the center of the city and Monument Plaza, where the last visible piece of Coruscant could be seen. It was from the Minari mountain range, and the summit itself was called Umet. The reason the younglings traveled here was for a much deeper reason than sightseeing. Sure, tourists from all around the galaxy got to come here and see the mountain covered by a city, but for the Jedi, it led them to building a connection to the planet itself. Sure, the cities were alive, but Coruscant too was alive. The planet was a living being, and the Jedi believed that they needed a connection to the planet to be sufficient as Jedi. For the younglings, this was a virtuous step in understanding the harmony of the Force, because Coruscant wasn't light as a whole, there was darkness. The Jedi understood the darkness and they did not fear it. When they did their morning meditations, they remembered the presence of the darkness, they understood its existence and why it was there. However, they slowly, as they grew up, began to disregard it, because the darkness itself was not a threat to them or their kind. Titus' meditation began with him kneeling at the edge of the temple. His instructor told the class to take their focus away from the busyness of the city, and focus purely on the Force itself, and to focus not just on the Force, but on the breathing of the planet. For the Jedi, using the Force was as simple as it was to breathe, but to connect to the root of where they were was essential to life itself. So Titus listened to his instructor, as he had done every day since he arrived here at the Jedi Temple. Titus could feel the planet of Coruscant breathing, down through the summit of Umit, all the way down to the dead soil beneath the cities of Coruscant. He could feel the critters crawling around in the underbelly of Coruscant, he could hear the breeze in the trees atop of the residential buildings in the sea of the city. After the first hour of the day was done, the Jedi younglings moved to their next task, which for them would be Yuja T. The younglings would split their decision on where they would do this. Most of the time it was in the same location where they were at during their morning meditation, mostly so they didn't have to waste time wandering at the temple trying to find a suitable, unoccupied location. The temple had 10,000 individuals, most of which were present, so there was limited room elsewhere throughout the temple. Yuja T was a study and practice of a more elegant movement for the Jedi. This consisted of simple movements that required a simple central balance or moving around on the lesser used limbs of your body. Yuja T was a combination of the meditation during the beginning parts of the day and the focus of the mind and soul. Yuja T was for the body and for the heart. These were all interlocked. 
as they were meant to be. The core to be a Jedi was serenity, and these Jedi had that. They practiced it and they loved it. Each Yuja T session was different, especially depending on location. It could get more physically challenging. For example, where Titus and his class were today, on the outer edge of the Jedi Temple, their Yuja T session would include a lot of focus on balance and harmony, while standing on your hands next to the edge almost about to fall off. Of course, there were other forms of Yuja T if one could not perform the task physically such as standing on one leg. Yuja T was always a great joy for the Jedi, and they all enjoyed it. Not long after Yuja T, which went on for about another hour, the younglings would have their first course of the day. The children of the temple were fed insane portions, but it was necessary. They were growing children, and even more than that, children of the Force. If you thought a normal child could eat out your entire stash of food, imagine what a ravenous child with the power of the Force could do. Though because the children had a regiment lifestyle, they immediately moved on to their next task, which after each eating was learning. Their learning was a line of several topics. Older younglings got to choose what they wanted because they were about to become Padawans. Younglings below the age of 10 had to perform in all the basic classes, maths, sciences, histories, political atmospheres, difficult decision making, and much more. For younglings, they had to undergo all the difficult learning first because as Jedi, over the past 25,000 years, realized and learned is that children of the Force absorb and retain a lot more information early on and they held it for much longer. So topics like politics and difficult decision making weren't too insane for 9 year olds to learn. Above the age of 10, students had basics, but aside from that, they could choose mostly what they wanted to learn. At this point, they didn't know if they would find any interest in becoming a counselor, a sentinel, or a guardian. These classes helped them down their path of selection, because it wasn't an easy choice. The youngling classes typically lasted for 4 straight hours. After that was an hour straight of lightsaber training, and then the younglings were set free for 3 hours. They could play eat, work, learn, spend time inside anywhere in the temple, and so on. But after three hours, it was time to regather with the class for one final lesson, and then after that, one final meditative hour as the city descended in the dusk. Younglings, for their final hour during the day, would choose between meditation and yuja tea. It was entirely a personal decision allowed from the youngest age of which you can make a decision, but the purpose was to aid individuals with going to sleep. Every kid was different, and both techniques typically worked for every student. Currently, Titus was in his second hour of free time, but it was about to come to an end. There were mere minutes until he had to meet up with his class inside of the Great Hall of the Jedi Temple. Though he knew where his class was going, today they were going to be learning with Master Joker Costa knew inside the Jedi archives. Though minutes before, Titus had to be with his class, he caught wind of something traveling around the Jedi temple. It was weird. A lot of Jedi inside the temple, who were typically quiet or even unemotional, were vibrant all of a sudden. There was a lot of conversation traveling around the temple, but not everyone knew yet. As a youngling, it was a bit scary, admittedly. Titus looked up at the Jedi. He was shorter than all of them. He was still a boy, of course he was. He kept hearing words, though none of them made any sense without any coordination. He heard the word boy, and then he heard the word lightsaber. There was another word, but he kept hearing hood a lot. Maybe it was wood. Titus thought that maybe it was something that happened on a wooden world. He didn't know. Maybe it wasn't a boy. Maybe it was a toy or a ploy. He didn't know what to think. Lightsaber was the only one he could actually really identifiably make out. Titus made his way to the class and caught up. All of his peers were talking about it, but they too didn't know what it was. One of the little boys told someone that he heard that Jedi Master Plo Koon was involved, though another boy said it was likely Quinlan Voss who did something, considering he was always up to something. The instructor corrected the boy, telling him to refer to Quinlan Voss as Master Quinlan Voss. The boy nodded his head. A girl perked up and told one of her close friends that she heard it was something to do with the Mon Calamari and how the planet it was traveling towards the core. That didn't make any sense. Titus looked over at his friends and asked her what she had heard. She shook her head, telling Titus that she didn't know. She was just trying to listen to all the conversations around her, but they were unintelligible. They didn't make any sense. Every so often, you hear a planet get thrown around out into the conversation. Mon Calamari, then it was Kuat after that Mandalore. Someone even said the word Utapau. At least the children knew their geography, but they still couldn't figure out what was going on. The instructor told their class to quiet down. They were going to be heading towards the Jedi Archives. As they walked there, they walked past Jedi Master Imogun D and Master Stacey Tin, talking to each other. It was a really odd day. Typically, one didn't see Masters from the High Council more than once, but even Titus saw 
Depa Balaba, and Yara Al Puf earlier during the day. It's not like it was rare to see a master from the High Council, but the temple itself seemed to be on high alert, without actually being on high alert. When the kids entered the archives, there was a young man seated at the table with Jocasta Nu standing behind him. She told Padawan Obi-Wan Kenobi that she would be right with him. She had to get the class started on their next assignment. Obi-Wan smiled and nodded his head, before waving at the younglings as they walked by. All the kids adored Obi-Wan. He was a charming young man, and he never belittled anyone. Everyone could tell he was going to be a special Jedi someday. The kids were all seated down at a reserved table within the Jedi archives so that they could begin instruction with Jocasta News program. This session, which for every youngling happened once a week, consisted of something new for them to learn. It was either a scavenger hunt or an astrological study. Other times, it was a space route, corridor, or run that could be used to get from point A to point B. Most of it was all programmed into a computer terminal inside the tablets that the Jedi had. They were all presented as games to children, but they were really informational, and they were constructed to assist younglings in remembering and memorizing all the different aspects of the galaxy around them. It was incredibly important to make sure the younglings felt a tangible grip with the galaxy they were in. Titus sat down and got straight to work. He was a quiet boy. He didn't do much in the way of being rambunctious or anything. Not a goody two-shoes, but he also wasn't a bad boy. A nice happy medium, if you will. He did what he was asked, and he didn't really ever think about it deeper than what it was on the surface level. As Titus got to work, he looked over his shoulder and saw Jedi Master Qui-Gon Jinn grab Obi-Wan's attention and start walking with him away. Jocasta Nu kept trying to push the children a little harder. The mind games were always difficult, but they were meant to be. There was nothing easy about being a Jedi, and that's something these kids always needed to know. After the lesson with Jocasta Nu, the student's instructor picked them up and took them back to the meditation chambers. This time, it was a more secluded space. She requested that all the children get onto their knees. The instructor got down onto her knees too. She spoke softly, but also very somberly. She told the students that there was a bit of trouble that the Jedi had learned about today. Now, it wasn't anything super negative, at least as far as the Jedi were aware of, but it involved Jedi Master Qui-Gon Jinn. The students were confused. They all saw Qui-Gon Jinn only an hour before. Surely nothing bad could have happened to him. The instructor told the class that what had been circulating around the temple, since shortly before their instruction with Jocasta Nu began, was that Master Qui-Gon Jinn faced down a dark side acolyte. While it was unknown at the moment if this was a Sith or not, the individual donned a crimson blade, and he knew the Jedi arts very well. When the sentence finished, it felt like all the air was sucked out of the room. The children all looked at each other, with a very easy to read fear on their faces. The instructor continued to tell the younglings that for the past couple days, there had been a lot of negativity in the galaxy. The Jedi Order had been trying to keep it hidden from the younglings for the time being, but there was no hiding it after revelation of the possible Sith. The Jedi Council wanted to keep it on the down low, but news traveled fast. The instructor told the students that a couple days ago, the Trade Federation set up a blockade around the peaceful planet of Naboo. Jedi Master Qui-Gon Jinn and Obi-Wan Kenobi were dispatched to the planet to resolve an issue with the Trade Federation, but that clearly wasn't the case for the situation. She told her class that they would trust the Force during this process. Jedi Master Qui-Gon Jinn and his Padawan were heading towards Naboo with the Queen of Naboo to repair this issue surrounding this mysterious figure. The instructor admitted that she didn't know if it was a return of the Sith or not, but that's likely what the younglings would hear until the mysterious figure was brought to justice. The instructor told the class to not worry about anything until everything was over and done with. Surely, nothing wrong would happen. Across the galaxy in the Outer Rim, the Palumbo family was doing as well as ever, and Rome was too. Janus had just received news that the Romans had won an incredible battle upriver in central Italy. The Battle of Metaras was a crucial win for the Romans, considering the war had been going on for the last 10 years or so. It looked like the Republic of Rome could prove to become victorious in this war. Janus and Aurelia in the last couple of years had themselves another child. This was a three-year-old daughter by the name of Luna. She was just like her older brother, which worried her parents. It took them seven years worth of trying to finally land the target, and Luna showed signs of the magic abilities that the Jedi mentioned to them before. Though it had been three years since Luna was born, and without the Jedi showing up, it seemed like Luna would be free from having to worry about intergalactic turmoil. Janus was really excited about that because he didn't want to get rid of another child. Giving children away to the Jedi was a really difficult task for a parent to do, especially because it's like the child died, but they were out in the galaxy doing anything else without the child ever knowing who their parents were. Janus many times thought about how much he regretted letting go of his son, and how if Luna ever showed signs that he would never do it again, but Aurelia told Janus that if the Jedi returned, it would be Luna's decision if she wanted to go with the Jedi or not. 
Janice knew he couldn't disagree with that. Well, he could, but he didn't think it would be a good idea to try and stop it if it was the case. He didn't want to think about it too often because he was hoping the Jedi would just pass by and never pick up on it. Though, Janice had a very important task to tend to. He was escorting a group of 2400 legionaries from Sicily to Rome. It was a very long journey and it was to reinforce the troops that were fighting off the Cartharagians in the continental Italian peninsula. Janice told his wife that he loved her. Since his son had vanished into the galaxy, his father had died, and his mother-in-law had passed away just a year before. It had been a heavy decade, but the Palumbos were working through it. Janice gave his love to his daughter and expected to see his little Luna when he returned, smiling and then leaving. It was a beautiful day in Messina. The sun was glistening, and Janice's day was off to a great start with a handful of focaccia as he made his way down to the docks. He got to travel separately. When he landed on the mainland, he would go on horseback and lead the troops all the way up to the capital. It was once a year when Janus had to leave Sicily, so it wasn't anything too uncommon for him to do. It was just a bit of a hassle. All the dirt and cobble roads, while on horseback or even in a chariot, was a bit of a pain. But it beat marching on it, so he had no real room to complain or worry about it. During this time, Aurelia wouldn't do much other than spend time with her daughter. She was really excited about the prospect of having her daughter with her, because typically the journey from Sicily to Rome would take a couple of weeks. Considering the vessels would sail out of Messina all the way up to Naples, and then from there, the hike would take a little bit more than two or three days, sometimes four or five, depending on the weather. On top of that, Janice would end up inside of Rome for close to a week, and then the trip back, of course. Though Janice didn't resent it, he liked it a lot, and before Luna was born, he and Aurelia went to Rome together. But the journey wasn't exactly the trip they wanted to take with the child. Besides, no one liked crying babies on long boat rides, so it was saving everyone else the pain too. On Messina, Aurelia and Luna were out at a local restaurant and sitting outside with Luna's grandmother. Everything was perfect, the day was beautiful, it was closer to the end of the year, and the weather was a little cooler, but not cold. Of course, it was the Mediterranean, but the sun was popping in and out of the clouds, and the breeze was gentle off the port, and Messina was as beautiful as always. Mother-in-law and daughter were having glasses of wine that had been saved for the last 50 years. Part of the benefit of being partitions is that you got access to the luxuries that no one else got. The wine these two were drinking was one of the final bottles that the family had saved. The batch of wine made was actually planted in the ground before Sicily became part of the Republic of Rome. Obviously, it was harvested and created afterwards. It was an exquisite taste. Aurelia told her mother-in-law that she was going to grab some bread from the bakery and some cheeses as well. She would be back momentarily. When Aurelia got up and walked away, Luna's grandmother started talking to her in the loving, caring way that a grandmother could always do, not expecting any of it to make any sense to Luna. The little girl was just so happy sitting in her grandmother's lap that it didn't really make a difference. Around the corner, Aurelia ran into a familiar face and her heart was filled with sadness. Master Jera Cron looked at Aurelia with almost a bit of shame in her face. She informed the Sicilian woman that her child drew the attention of the Force and of the Jedi, and she would like permission to run a test. Aurelia's heart broke into a million pieces. She didn't want to, but she was curious. Master Cron told Aurelia that she didn't need to do it if she didn't want to. It was just time for Master Cron to come here and see if the ripples in the Force were correct. Aurelia told Jara that she could do it. She didn't want to admit it, but she was curious. How could she not be? This would be two for two godly children. Maybe Aurelia and Janice were special too. Jara nodded her head and walked with Aurelia back to the grandmother and little Luna. Jara, similarly as she did to Titus, smiled softly and knelt down, telling Luna that this would only hurt a little. The grandmother looked at Aurelia and didn't say a word. Luna got her little prick and then went back to doing what she was doing. Jara sat down on the table with the other two women while they simply sat impatiently waiting for the results to come back. Jared took a deep breath when she saw the midichlorian count. She spoke up telling the two women that the child had a midichlorian count of 14,300, nearly 600 higher than her older brother. Jared told the women that to have two children with the force was rare, but to have two exceptionally talented children was even more so. Jared reiterated to them that she would not take Luna with her if they did not want her to come. Jared then asked where Janice was. Aureli was surprised that after all these years, years, she remembered the name of her husband, but Jared did, and she wanted to be as personal as possible. She was a Jedi, she didn't carry normal emotions, though she knew it was difficult sometimes for parents to give up their children, especially on primitive worlds like Earth. Aurelia looked at her mother-in-law with tears in her eyes as she nodded her head. Aurelia knew her children were destined for greatness, every parent believed that their child were destined, but Titus and now Luna were special, and they knew it. Aurelia said goodbye to her daughter. The tragedy for her would be telling her husband that Luna was taken by the Jedi, and while Janice and Aurelia 
agreed that Luna would make the decision, Aurelia made it for her. Life would surely be easier for Luna away from Earth, with a civilization that attained intergalactic travel. Jera picked up the child and took Luna to the starship she arrived on. On Coruscant, where he was filling the entire Jedi Temple, news was slowly filling the temple. Youngling Titus Palumbo wasn't aware of what was going on, because currently he was performing in front of a cohort of peers, masters, and soon-to-be masters. All the younglings a part of Titus's class were showing off their skills and passing their trials so that they could be picked by a Jedi waiting to have a new student. Master Yoda was here, overseeing the trials. Half of the Jedi Council was here too. Plo Koon, Ceci Tin, Depa Balaba, Opa Rancis, Adi Gallia. Yoda tapped his cane on the ground, and immediately Titus began his Padawan trials. Every Padawan had to complete these trials, and currently Titus was on the last trial. Focus. The other eight of nine trials he'd completed were teamwork, isolation, fear, anger, betrayal, forgiveness, instinct, and protection. Titus's best trial was teamwork, and his most difficult one to overcome was anger. He was a powerful young student. By no means was he Mace Windu, but he was strong. His birth planet contributed to his strength in the Force, but his anger could very easily turn him away from the ways of the Jedi. The focus test, which is what he was doing, was about a Jedi's concentration and their ability to allow the Force to guide them. In front of the Jedi gathered, Titus leapt through the air, spinning three times and landing on his tippy toes. He closed his eyes and reached around and ignited his lightsaber, and an emerald blade shot out of it. Three probe droids dropped down from the ceiling as Titus planted his foot down, holding his balance, spinning the blade around his body, blocking every single shot that came his way, using the force to knock out the droids. He then jumped through the air and landed on his other foot, sheathing his lightsaber and then slowly falling down to his knees and looking up at Master Yoda. The Grand Master told Titus that he had passed his Padawan trials. As soon as Yoda said this, the Master of the Order walked in. Titus stood up and walked over to the set of seats where the other Padawans were. Mace knelt down and spoke to Yoda privately. When Yoda heard the information, he told Mace to repair the council to go to the planet of Naboo. He also suggested that Mace see if Master Dooku would like to accompany the council to Naboo as well. Yoda turned around and with a straight face, he told all the Masters and Knights ready to take on their new students to stand up and prepare to select their student. All the Jedi who were already Jedi Masters were able to go first. A couple of the other kids in the class were picked before Titus. This wasn't a big deal. Most of the time, Jedi Masters picked students based off of their personalities, because it was more so about the personality of a student rather than the skills of a student. If a student had the difficult personality, then they would be a pain to deal with. And established Masters, especially those who had that before, didn't want to do that again. Some did, but that wasn't the scenario for most of them. Titus waited, and then a Jedi Master walked up to him. This was a very tall Jedi. Jedi, but it was much different than any of the other Jedi present in the room, even throughout the temple. His species was rare to come across in general, but he was a Trandoshan and his name was Master Usk Bemos. The Trandoshan Jedi was an established Jedi Master, having trained one other Jedi student in his lifetime. Trandoshans tend to live for a solid 60 years averagely, but being that Master Bamaz was a Force user, he could likely live past that marker for a long while. Regardless, Usk asked Titus if he would mind becoming a student, to which Titus was incredibly excited. He was thrilled for the opportunity to learn from a Jedi Master of such caliber. The Master and Apprentice duo started walking out of the room. When they got there, the collection of High Council members that were in the room were standing in a circle. There were a couple of audible words, but neither Usk or Titus could hear them. They started walking in a different direction. Walking towards them was a saddened looking Master Yaddle. She walked by the two Jedi and told the other Council members that Master Dooku would not be a accompanying them to the planet of Naboo. Master Usk, being Trandoshan, heard all of it, and he turned around and stopped. Titus looked up at his new master and asked what was wrong. Usk turned around and looked at his student. He said that one of the Jedi sent to Naboo had been killed in the conflict. They started down the hallway again. As Usk admitted, it was a shameful that a Jedi had to be killed in the process of freeing Naboo from the Trade Federation. But Qui-Gon Jinn was now one with the Force, and that's all that was needed to be said about it. Titus told his master that there seemed like there was something wrong in the Force. Usk told Titus that he was highly attuned with the Force, and because of that, he was able to pick up on these types of things a little easier. But the death of Qui-Gon Jinn certainly would be a reason he felt this. Titus shook his head, admitting that there was something else that made him feel this way. Usk told Titus that they would figure it out on a later date, but for now, it was time for them to get to know each other. On the other side of the galaxy, in the Outer Rim, Janus returned to his home. When he entered, it was quiet. 
way too quiet. He heard coughing and ran up the stairs to find his mother laying ill in bed. Janice asked what happened, to which Aurelia told him that she didn't know. She was fine up until that night, and then after dinner she felt sick. It turned out to be a severe case of food poisoning. Janice asked where little Luna was, and then when Aurelia turned around, his heart shattered. He turned towards the door and got to his feet, walking away, his breathing shallowed, and he walked into the hallway. His head spun around in circles and he stumbled out onto the balcony with tears in his eyes. His heart was killing him and when he got to the balcony he fell over, with a broken heart. Aurelia came out to see if he was alright. He certainly wasn't. He asked why she let Luna go, and Aurelia told a soft lie, saying that it was what Luna's decision was, not hers, just as they had agreed. The two of them hugged. Later that night, Janice's mother would be taken by the gods and be ushered away into death. On Coruscant, the Jedi were hiding information from the rest of the Order. Master Ust had a surprise for his young student. Master Jera Kron approached Titus and told him that there was someone they had brought into the temple, not too long beforehand, and she had passed all the extra requirements and she was now a member of the Jedi Order. Master Kron brought Titus to the room where his sister was and showed her to the 12-year-old Padawan. Titus looked down at his sister and didn't really know what to say or feel. He spent his entire life following the code, so for him to see his younger sister, it was kind of like, meh. She was sleeping, so she didn't see or even notice him. Master Kron told Titus that he could be of assistance to her if he liked. As siblings inside the Jedi Temple, typically, they helped each other out. Titus nodded his head and said that he would consider doing so. As he walked out of the room, he saw Master Windu walking alongside Eeth Koth. The two Jedi were talking about a disappearance. Titus's master had been talking about it, because Echoes were traveling around the temple. Some people knew, but it was just confined to the High Council. All anyone could determine is that ever since the death of Qui-Gon Jinn, things felt different. Even though former Padawan Obi-Wan Kenobi had seemingly killed the Sith Assassin, no one was entirely sure what to think about the predicament. Master Usk was unsure about what this could mean, but he did know that two Jedi Masters had gone missing. One of them was former council member Yaddle, and the other one was Master Dooku. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is part two of our 10 part series. Again, special thanks to Benjamin Wells, Tiger Boy, Darth Revan, Pimp Daddy Bane, The Last Jedi, Apollo, Jedi Sloth, Mad Mad A Studios, Anakin 003, Lemon Knight, Flan Bassis, The Man with Three First Names, Dark Saint 46, and Lord Deadwing for supporting the channel. You guys know what to do. Smash that like button. I hope you all are enjoying thus far. Remember, the story has already been written out, so it's already been told in the story of time. I am very excited for you guys to see where this is going. I hope you guys can see what kind of direction the story is going in. Otherwise, I love you all, spread the love, and always remember my friends, may the force be with you.